Hello everyone, my name is Loco, and today it is time for a professional match of StarCraft 2. Spawning here in the southeast corner of Port Alexander and playing with the Red Zerg drones. He's from South Korea and he goes by the name of Impact. His opponent in the opposite corner playing with the blue SCVs. Apparently right there he's got Samwise spinning around on his main command center. People call him the Towel Terran. Of course, we're looking inside of the main base of Gumiho. By the way, for those of you curious as to why he's called the Towel Terran, if I'm not mistaken, he has some sort of condition that uh, makes it so that he gets excessive sweating from his hands. So generally speaking, whenever you see him play in offline tournaments and there's a camera shot on him, if you pay attention, you'll notice that generally he's got a, a towel over his mouse hand, which is pretty interesting. I guess that's just to, uh, to maintain a solid grip throughout the game, but... People do call him the Tower Terran. Now, as you guys know, I'm a massive fan of Gumiho. He is probably my favorite Terran player at this point in the game. The man is an absolute legend. He's very, very good. And he likes to mix it up. That's what I really, really like. So, when it comes to top-level Terran players, right? I think the current top three, in no particular order, is Innovation, Maru, and Gumiho. Gumiho may be a little bit weaker than these other two, but then again, the recent GSL code S results uh, do state that he's pretty darn good. I don't want to spoil too much, but regardless, uh, Gumiho, other than, for example, an Innovation or a Maru, he likes to mix it up. He loves going for mech, but he's not afraid to go for a variety of units and completely blindside his opponent. So I'm excited to see where this game is going to take us, as Gumiho never really seems to play the same game twice. Impact, though, generally speaking, right, if you if you would have told me um, this was going to be a game that was played a couple weeks ago, generally speaking, I would call Gumiho the clear favorite in this match. That's not to say that Impact is a weak player by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I just looked it up. He's the current rank 27 in the world. But Gumiho has just been extremely solid lately. However, recently in the GSL Code S, and there's going to be some minor spoilers here, okay? But in a group of four players, we had Gumiho, Impact, Zest and Trust, and it was actually Impact who went out first in that group and went, who went completely undefeated. So, I didn't actually see those games myself, I just know about the results, but I'm really excited to figure out uh, what Impact has got in mind right here for t this particular game, because I think in most, in most people's minds, right, if you have a group with Trust, Gumiho, Impact, and Zest, I think most people would assume it's Gumiho and Zest that make it out, especially with how well Protoss is doing right now. But apparently Impact, though, showing us who's boss, he knows exactly what is going on right now in the current meta of StarCraft. Regardless, a couple of Zerklings have already made their way across the map. Ideally, they kill the SCV that's building the command center, but with two Marines produced right here, I think this should be just fine. Even though the Marines do lose their life right there for the Terran Dominion, with the Hellion coming up right here, I think that Impact is going to be shut down just, just fine. And... The thing is, um, as long as you finish up the command center and as long as you do not delay the orbital command here, Terran is not going to be in that much trouble. I mean, we have a so-called standard in StarCraft for a reason. These kind of builds, they've been, uh, they've been tried and tested for many, many, many years. And there's a reason why they're so standard. And that's because they're very good against basically any kind of early game here for the Terran player. And likewise, actually, for Zerk as well. A lot of Zerks lately have been enjoying going for that quick spawning pool. And even though Zerkling speed right now is, I believe, already finished. Yes, it is indeed already done. Um, it's not really going to achieve too much here for the time being. Ooh. The Marines actually do manage to kill the Overlord. That's going to deny quite a bit of scouting here for Impact, who actually decided to already go for a lair. That is like a three and a half minute lair there for Impact. Generally speaking, we see a Bailing Nest or a Roach Warren coming up right about right now. And then a lair like a minute afterwards. So this is actually considered to be a rather quick lair. We'll have to keep an eye out on exactly what he's got in mind. No additional gas is taken, so I don't think it's going to be any kind of really quick, uh, for example, like Mutalisk or Spire play in general. We'll see exactly what he's got in store here. Regardless, already making a couple of those Spore Crawlers, and I think that's a response to him knowing that there's a good chance that Banshees might be coming. Did he see anything? He didn't, but he did see the addition right there of the Tech Lab, and that's all the information that he really needs. Cloaking Field will be finishing up here in just a little bit for Gumiho, and the first Banshee actually gets scouted right there with a Patrolling Zirkling as well. Oh, it's actually going to be... Oh, I love this. Okay, it's actually going to be a Nidus network here for Impact. So he's adding on additional Queens. A group of Marines is actually currently making their way across as well. 
Maybe they're actually just an overlord hit squad right there. Look at that. What? Like, this is what I mean, right? He's a top-level Terran player and he goes for an overlord hit squad. I don't think he means to really push with this. Queens and Zerklings are going to be able to defend that just fine. Overseer joining the fray right here as well. And Gumio actually, ooh, uncharacteristically, does lose that first Banshee there for absolutely free. And I think that's boss, uh, that was primarily because he was preoccupied with those Zerklings at the front. Nidus Worm, though, currently going up inside of the main base of Terran. And Gumiho has absolutely no idea that this is the case. I'm sure that the Queens are already loading up. And that means they're going to be able to transport straight from the Zerk side of the map towards the main base of the Terran. Now, there is a siege tank out. It's immediately gonna unsiege. The second siege tank actually is available as well. At least that's something here, but the third command center did not finish up just yet for Gumiho, and losing that one would actually be quite painful already, but I feel like just killing the third CC is not enough. I feel like you need to do more damage. And actually, even with the third CC finishing right now, this could be a pretty good position here for Gumiho, all things considered. Obviously, there's a lot of lost mining time already. There's more and more factories coming up. And a couple bunkers right now also oh, creating a choke point right here for Gumiho, allowing the siege tanks to do a tremendous amount of damage. But I think all things considered, right, this is not really that much damage that Impact is going to be able to deal. I mean, he needs to kill a substantial amount of SCVs to justify this push. Beautiful defense so far here by Gumiho, man. Look at this man's panic mode, right? Absolutely calmly unseating the tank and repositioning it right there. Well, it does look like Impact wants to continue onwards here for a little while longer. I, I just realized he actually decided to go for a couple of spine crawlers here and then also a sport crawler. So he really, he really does look like he wants to continue pressure here for a little while longer. But those siege tanks, they're just simply so very good at zoning. They're in beautifully well-guarded positions. I don't think they are going to be able to get picked off right now. And with them continuously shelling away, I've got a feeling that Impact is going to have a really hard time breaking this. So he decides to go for a Spire right now as well as additional gases and then a Nidus Worm over in the natural. There's a single Banshee ready to deal with that. A couple of the Marines decide to reroute over there as well. I think this one should be dealt with before it can emerge. And yes, while it will just barely be killed in time, so far, Gumiho has managed to hold on. This is a weird game. I love this. Oh, man, StarCraft in 2019, it's nothing like StarCraft in 2018, okay? I mean, I, I talked about standard builds earlier. There's not really like a super standard anymore. People have started to figure out how much value they can get out of a bunch of units. And actually, oh, the Queens managed to snipe the command center right there. Gumiho making a couple of errors right here in this game. And that's certainly uh, gonna cost him quite a bit. Losing that Banshee for free and then also now losing that third command center for free is gonna hurt him uh, for at least the time being. And that's gonna make it difficult to progress throughout this game. Now, supply-wise, he's in a great spot. He decides to spend some of his additional resources right now on uh, a couple of those command centers as well. The thing is, the Spire is now undetected and Impact, I think he plans on completely blindsiding his opponent for another one of those rounds. And this time around, it's gonna be flying Zerg units. Now, I'm looking at the middle lines here for Terran. I'm not seeing a single missile turret. By the way, I do want to compliment the build right here that Gumiho is going for. This is actually a mech build that started off with like, what, 20 Marines? This is, ex like, very difficult to scout, right? If you're a Zerg player, like, you, you see, like, 20 Marines in the early part of the game. Do you assume it's gonna be mech, or do you assume it's gonna be bio? Well, apparently it's gonna be bio into mech, which is giving me some, some StarCraft 1 vibes. I'm sure there's, like, one StarCraft 1 nerd right now freaking out over this strategy. This is really cool. Anyways, it's, it's really the only source of his anti-air right now, though, and that's gonna be rather painful. Now... The army does decide to make its way across the map. Without Stimpak, without Combat Shield, these Marines are not going to be very strong. Like they normally would be at this point in the game. But I think for now, there's really not enough Mutas here to deal with this anyway. And I think actually, with this group of those infantry units, Gumiho is going to be just fine. Yep. What a cool game. So many mind games happening. So many... Uh so many uh, of these small moves are being made here to try and outsmart the opponent. I love this though. This is one of the things that Gumiho popularized, uh, going for the double Metavex and then also the Thors in them as well. This absolutely shuts down Muta play, and it's actually one of the main reasons as to why Mutalisk are barely played right now in the Terran versus Zerg matchup. For the longest time, everyone realized, yes, Thors are the way to go when it comes to playing against Mutas, but they oftentimes can't be in position. And Gumiho was the one who started playing Metavex 
uh, with uh, with Mech as as one of the very first players, and I think he may actually be the one uh, who really started getting the true value out of Metafex uh, when it comes to playing against Terran, uh, or when it comes to playing with Terran Mech. Alrighty, so while this is all going on, right? Impact has secured himself full three base saturation, and he now also has that fourth base coming up. Even though Gumiho did take quite a bit of damage here in the early game, I think it's very manageable. I don't think it's really that big of a deal whatsoever. These Mira should be dealt with just fine, and he continuously tried to get these Zerkling run bys, but so far, I haven't really seen them deal that much damage just yet. Oh, the friendly fire right there is not going to be enough, and actually, the defense right here, man, of Gumiho has been extremely impressive. One of the Metavex right there does take a lot of damage. We do see some magic boxing right here that allows Impact to split up the units and negate some of that splash damage of the Thors, but still, you can see the amount of range that Thors have. It actually got buffed in one of the recent patches of StarCraft. It's now 11 range, which is one of the longest range actually in the game, and uh, they're going to be able to deflect those mutas just fine. Apparently, Gumiho now wants to go for a switch to watch Cyclones. So even though he still ends up with that Siege Tank, Cyclone, Thor, Hellion-based mid-game, the, the way he got there is something I've never seen before. Going for this many Marines, being safe in the early game against pretty much everything, blindsiding his opponent and maybe even forcing that Muta play out because he assumed it was going to be bio play and then all of a sudden going for mech, it's, it's really cool, and I think it's, uh, it, it's going to allow Gumiho right now to be in a pretty strong position. Supply-wise, obviously, you really want to be, if you're the Zerg player, right? You really want to be ahead of the Terran player when they're playing mech. Terran mech is scariest when it maxes out. And that's the position that Gumiho is going to find himself in in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, though, Impact has decided to now transition towards Infestors. There's Hydras, there's Roaches, and then there's a whole lot of upgrades here for Zerk as well. So it's going to be Roach Hydra with Infestor support primarily. Now he's dealing a little bit of damage, finally gets a couple kills right there on those mules, but I really feel like those Mutas have not really paid for themselves in any way, shape, or form. And right now, Gumiho is doing Gumiho things, he's expanding all over the place, and he got himself a lot of very solid mining bases here already. And that's kind of what you want to have when you're uh, when you're playing against Terran Mech, right? You kind of you kind of want to try and prevent them from expending so much so they can't max out. And look at that, right? This really shows that really keen game sense of Gumiho. The amount of resources lost is heavily in favor right here of Terran, who now decides to go for a push across the map with a bunch of those Hellions and a bunch of those Cyclones. This is like the mobile aspect of the Terran Mech army, and then all of those other units we see sitting back here, they're going to be the immobile army. Still those Marines, man. So cool. I love that. Also going for a hit squad of Banshees. I mean, I, I've taught you guys many times before how much I love the, the Banshee hit squads. I think it's so very powerful, but it's one of the things that Gumiho has been messing around with quite a bit over the last couple of months. And Well, apparently he found a sweet spot where there's not going to be a lot of detection here for Zerg. As soon as the Overseer comes in, this should be deflected, and I think one of these Banshees will go down. But obviously, he doesn't really need these benches anymore in the late game. At this point, you kind of want to start replacing them with, like, better air units, like, for example, better cruisers, or, for example, liberators, which is going to be the name of the game right here for Gumiho. Uh, but he is slowly but surely approaching that maxed-out Terran state. All right. Impact, though? Mm, okay. So this is something I haven't seen too much either. Usually we see players choosing to go for either Vipers or Infestors. In this particular game, Impact is gonna go for both. So I think what he's trying to achieve right here is Blinding Cloud and Abducts with these Vipers. So if he can Blinding Cloud, of course, on a couple of those Siege Tanks, he can shut them down. Uh, but he can also Abduct some of the high-value targets, like for example, Thors, especially when they're inside a Metavex. They're picked off very easily. And then these Infestors, they can be utilized, uh, especially right here with that Fungal Growth. The Terran uh, mech army, especially this part right here, is very, very mobile. It's very, very strong, but it's also very easy to pick off because it doesn't have a lot of hit points. So if you manage to abduct them and you manage to fungal growth them especially, you can kill them quite smoothly here. But the thing is, pushing into the siege top Terran line is going to be super tricky. Now the Mutas, by the way, he's been doing an excellent job keeping them alive. I think, though, their last numbers are going to be picked off right here. And yes, that is going to be the Mutas taken care of. 
In the meantime, though, the Thors apparently made their way towards the main base of Zurich, who's currently preoccupied all the way towards the other side of the map. Keep in mind, there's still that Nidus Worm from earlier as well. A couple of Hellions apparently made their way towards the Mineral Line as well, but this is actually rather annoying. Thors with this set of upgrades are actually really good at dealing damage, right? Look at how much damage they're dealing. They may very well be able to kill that main hive. The Queen's actually coming up right now with the Transfuse. At the same time, we do see a Nidus Worm going up inside of the Natural of Terran, who is completely caught off guard by this. He's going to be able to send at least some of these Cyclones in. We'll be able to kill it just barely before it emerges, but it needs to be cautious. Generally speaking, right, Terran armies are not super fast. I mean, Cyclones obviously are, but they can have a hard time making their way back towards the mains and the naturals. And usually, the longer that the game goes on, the more the Terran army will be spread towards the center of the map. And if then all of a sudden, right, and if, if then all of a sudden a Nidus Worm goes up in the main, they won't be able to make it there in time. So Gumiho smartly decides to leave a couple of those units behind to take care of any kind of Nidus Worms that might be coming up. All right. So this Zerk army is looking rather scary, right? If there's one thing that Impact has been doing really well so far, it's getting those upgrades. So I think Terran is actually only at, yeah, plus one, plus two right now. He's only actually going for a single set of upgrades. So Impact is going to be able to hit a really good timing right here as soon as these upgrades are done. Or he could actually fight right now. He already does have that upgrade advantage. All right. So even though the way we've seen these players get to these army compositions has been strange, I think we are leading up to that really big clash here at some point, right? It kind of feel like uh, it kind of feels like we've been building up to one really tense moment where everything will clash and we will see this game being decided. It comes down to the engagement. Both players can easily win as long as they've got the correct engagement. And this is one of the fights that I think Zerk would like to take. Although, ooh, those liberation zones certainly make it difficult. Now, big fungal growth right there on a lot of those cyclones. And that all of a sudden allows this Zerk army to close the distance. We see a blinding cloud as a follow-up as well. Not allowing these cyclones to continue firing. But still, Gumiho gets quite a bit of value. And keep in mind, that was like literally the whole Zerk army fighting against like half of that of the Terran, right? I mean, there's a lot of supply caught up in a lot of those siege tanks, and a bunch of the Cyclones were held back. I, uh, I think that Gumiho is in a really good position here, but okay, I like this. Impact decides to increase the count right here of those Vipers. So initially, I think what he was trying to do is Fungal Growth and then Blinding Cloud. When you have this many Vipers, though, he's going to probably go up to like 10 here in a little bit. Uh, when you have that many Vipers, I think he's going to do what we saw Solar do a lot over the last couple of months. And that is just simply abduct every single one of those Cyclones when they're on the retreat. If he manages to pick up the Cyclones while they're on the retreat, it's one of the most valuable traits that Zerg players can make. The thing is, though, right now... Gumiho has decided he's got the economy to start replacing some of those lost cyclones with battle cruisers. Ideally, you want to switch most of your army over to air, right? The air units that Terran has are, are pretty insane, especially when you get some ravens into the mix and whatnot as well in the ultra late game. But this is going to be an interesting situation to be in. Oh, I love this. So, I feel like, so I was talking about like 2018 StarCraft compared to 2019, right? So it seems like the ways we get towards the late game are very, very different. And then the ultra late game is completely undecided right now. I, I actually don't know who's who's like currently the strongest late game player. There's a lot of weird unit compositions that players are trying out. And I gotta say, I like this position for Gumiho quite a bit. Still though, he needs to be careful. One small wrong engagement. And all of these Cyclones will be abducted. Look at the amount of energy right here on these Vipers. It all comes down to the fight. Mm, I don't know. I don't like this. Impact is losing a couple of those units that are trying to get into position. And uh, I think he wants to regroup the Hydras here for the most part. But while he's spending time repositioning those Hydra Discs, one of those hatcheries is already picked off. Finally, a couple of nice abducts come up. There you go. Gets himself a couple of free pickoffs, but still, I think that this base is certainly going to be killed as well. And with that, the mining that Impact has is not going to be that strong anymore. Oh, yep, okay, I love it. The fungal growth coming up right there picks up quite a lot of those units. So many abducts are bringing all of those Terran armies close to those paws of the Hydralisks. A lot of Liberators are picked off, but right now the Siege Tanks, obviously, are really scary. I think they're the strongest unit against Hydras at this point, and 
I mean, this is not really a, a composition you can easily engage into. Now, there is one Infester underground. Maybe it's going to try and force some of that friendly damage uh, by utilizing those uh, those uh, Infested Terrans. Sometimes you can force the Siege Tanks to deal some friendly fire. Instead, though, Impact is going to come in from several different angles, tries to get as much damage in as possible, and he does manage to pick up all of those Siege Tanks with ease. Fongo Growth right now joining the fray as well, and that is going to allow Gumiho to, uh, to lose all of his units. I mean... It allows Gumiho to lose all of the units. I did the commentator thing where I tried to start a sentence and then I finished it with a completely different word. It's okay. It's okay, look. Don't worry about it. The one better cruiser, though. Dealing so much damage. Does he have... No, he doesn't have technical jump. Sad moment right there. As the battle cruiser does not kill the hatchery, but it deals a lot of damage. And Well, apparently this opens up the front door right here for some of these uh, Hellions to get in as well. They're gonna morph into Hellbats? Uh, uh, oh my god. Gumiho picks up another base. And Well, if I'm looking right now at the amount of mining here, right? There's a lot of drones still available for Zerk, but the income is absolutely in favor here of Terran, who has been happily expanding to more and more command centers and to more and more mining bases as well. Now, Blinding Cloud, it does shut down planetary fortresses as well, so that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, although, apparently, in this case, he doesn't really care. He just simply wants to get that planetary with the DPS right there off those Hydras. A lot of SCVs are being picked off right now as well, and the Vipers actually are getting a lot of value abducting one siege tank after the other. Ooh, I love that. Liberator Siege up immediately. We see the Parasitic Bomb, but excellent micro there by Gumiho. Manages to deflect some of that splash damage. A couple of the Hellions made their way right now across the map while he's in a really tense situation. He's found the, the APM, apparently, to send some of these Hellions across as well. And even though a lot of SCVs were killed, even more drones looks like they're gonna... Or even more drones look like they're gonna end up dying here as well. Man, Gumiho! That was such a sexy move, right? So I, I really want to emphasize that. While he was microing like the Liberators and while he was trying to get everything into a beautiful position and he's macroing, he found the APM to send aliens across the map. It's It looks like such an easy move, but when you're actually in one of those games and you're actually playing such a complicated matchup, deciding that you have that APM available and making that decision to, to send just a couple of aliens into a vulnerable base, super cool. All right, that's a lot of Vipers, man. That's a lot of Parasitic Bombs. They're going to be able to soften up those Liberators very, very quickly. And the Hydras, they will be able to pick up all of those units with ease. Now, I can't help but notice, right, there's a lot of battle cruisers in the air. And right now, Siege Tank production is off the chart as well. He's abducting all of the Siege Tanks into the Hydralisk. But the Hydralisk are stuck in a corner. And I don't really see a way that Impact can get out of there. So even though Gumiho lost an awful lot of units and a lot of SCVs there at the end of the game, his army and his economy turned out to be superior to that of impact. I hope you enjoyed watching this game. If you did, make sure you hit that like button down below. And if you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get a notification as soon as I upload more. A special shout out to the Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much for all of your generosity. But for now, I want to thank you for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile all right. And I will see you once again in the next one.